You guys excited to get into the word this morning? You guys ready to kick this series off? You know, sometimes I get excited as your pastor. I come up here and I go, now, now, now you're a young senior pastor, Andrew. Be a mature, seasoned man of God with a shepherd's tone. Bring the people peace and comfort, right? I literally, I tell myself this. By the end of it, I'm like yelling and screaming, and I'm like, what happened? How did I get there, God? But I just get excited about God's word, and you guys get me fired up. I could blame you guys, right? I'll just blame you guys. You guys get me fired up. You guys are a preacher's church. I tell all of our guest speakers, I go, this is a preacher's church. You're gonna like preaching at our church, all right? And so many times, uh, you get your guest speakers, they go, man, I'm fired up today. You guys got me all fired up today. It's, it's, it's your guys' fault, right? But then the other reason, there's a practical reason. Sometimes I do do it intentionally because some of you are falling asleep in church. I see you. I see that you're manifesting the leaning tower of peace over there. You know, I see it. You need to wake up. I'm trying to keep you awake. Say, man, why is he shouting so much? There's people falling asleep in church. (laughs) We love you. We love you. And if you work late, God, God bless you for me. You do get credit for getting in the building. We love you. Here's what the Bible, go to Acts chapter 19, verse 1 through 6. Acts 19, 1 through 6. I'm going to meet you there. I'm going to start off in 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, we have all of our notes. We have all our scriptures on the screen, all the notes in our ICLV mobile app where you can follow along, add your own notes, email it to yourself, a PDF, and it's great for, for continuing to grow and studying the Word of God. I put some extra thing in the mobile app notes if you want to do a deeper study on this topic because I, I, I usually just collect a whole bunch of stuff, and I don't have time to fit in to a little Sunday sermon. Um, so here's what it says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3, as, as we look at the first installment here of God Still Speaks today. But one who prophesies strengthens others. One who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. Strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. Great verse there on the gift of prophecy. Let's go to Acts 19, 1 through 6 in the NIV. And it says, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, well, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one. Someone say the one. The one coming after him, that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Come on. Jesus, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that my last name is Mason. I thank you, Lord, you've called me to lay foundation, not being a cult, but to lay foundation, God. And so, Lord, I thank you, Lord, we're laying foundation this morning, God, through your word. I pray for strong theology, God, because if there's a strong foundation, you can build an unshakable building. So give us a strong foundation, God, so that we can position ourselves, Lord God, to be all you've called us to be. I thank you, Lord. Your word gives us this power in Jesus' name. And everybody said? That's what we're doing as we start this series. We're going to lay foundation this week. We're going to lay foundation. We're going to continue to go deeper and deeper. But we got to start off with some good foundation here. Our boys have friends in our neighborhood, and they're all over our neighborhood playing with friends. And and, uh, so some of their friends, they've invited to different church things here at our church. We've had their friends come to Vacation Bible School, VBS. We've had them come uh, to, to youth nights. We've had them come to our conferences, our kids' conferences that happen alongside our, our Prophetic and Holy Spirit conference. And so it's great. And it's great to see what God, God is doing something through, through our boys and in their friends' lives. But we had one of the moms uh, circle back with Camille. She goes, yeah, my, my kids got invited to church uh, by, your, by your son what's this prophetic conference thing that they're talking about? (laughs) And my wife said, well, at our church, we believe that God still speaks today, right? And then she said, oh, well, that makes sense. She's not someone who goes to church. I love my wife. You're awesome, honey. That's that's great. And it's it's a great way to explain this whole area of God wanting to speak to us and through us that we believe at our church that God still speaks today. 
And so when we read this passage in Acts 19, Paul comes up on these disciples in Ephesus. And he says, have you guys received the Holy Spirit? And they say, a a holy who? Huh? What are you talking about? Who's the Holy Spirit? And Paul goes, well, what, what baptism? He starts to kind of deconstruct how they got to where they're at. He goes, let me ask another layer deeper here. What baptism were you baptized into? They go, we were baptized into John's baptism. And he goes, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I got to get you beyond that. And I'm going to break that down a little bit, a little bit more here. But here's the thing is Paul baptizes them in Jesus in water. Paul lays hands on them, right? They begin to speak with spiritual language. They get baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says they begin to prophesy right there, these 12 guys from Ephesus, right? And and so it's interesting that Paul and the New Testament church, they had an expectation that faith in Christ was to be accompanied by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. That we are supposed to have an intimate relationship with the risen Savior who's alive, who sits on the throne at the right hand of God and is ready to interact in the midst of our lives. And he's seeing these guys, they're supposedly disciples, which that word is usually used for those who follow Jesus. They knew some things about Jesus, which we'll talk about here in a second, but they didn't even know who the Holy Spirit was. He goes, man, I gotta get you guys set straight here, man. We got to get you baptized in Jesus' name. We got to get you you filled with the Holy Spirit. And we got to get the gifts of the Holy Spirit moving in your life right now. We can't procrastinate on this thing. We can't just praise God that you, we have the same belief system and we have a mental agreement with biblical doctrine. We need to see something real moving in your life. It was about a year ago, I was was coming here to pick my boys up from school here. And I got here early um, just because of some of the different errands I had to run. And so I made a decision to take a prayer walk. We have a little pedestrian bridge on the back part of our property that goes across Summerlin Parkway into a park, and there's a walking trail. And so I put my AirPods in. I'm just worshiping, and I'm just praying, praying in the Spirit, and I'm just having some time with Jesus. And I walked all the way up, and there's like an outlook on Durango. It's not very scenic. It's just an elevation outlook into like some great desert dirt. Anyways, it's, it's a great Vegas outlook. So I, I walk up to that outlook, and I'm just worshiping and praying. And there's a guy over to my left. He's sitting down. He's by himself. He, he looks like he's enjoying some cave time. Guys, do you know what I mean? Cave time, like guys like to go into their cave. Do you guys, you, well, ladies, you know about this, right? You can tell when a guy's in his cave, right? They don't want to They don't want to socialize. They just want to be left alone, right? So just leave the guys alone. They don't want to talk. Their verbal quote was maxed out two weeks ago, all right? They don't have anything to say. Like, what are you thinking about? Nothing. Ever asked a guy that? What are you thinking about right now? Nothing. That's a guy's happy place right there. You know that? So I'm like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bother this guy. I'm having prayer time with Jesus. That guy's good. So I'm up there and I'm just praying and seeking God. And I begin to walk away. And as I'm walking away, I, I, I get a thought whispered to my mind. And I go, well, that's kind of random. And I'm starting to walk away. I go, oh man, is that that for is that for that guy? Oh, that'd be really random. Man, I could really make myself look weird here. Is this the Holy Spirit? And I keep walking, and then it keeps, it keeps hitting me. And well, pff, I'm going to think about this for the rest of the day. I better check. You know, it's okay to get a little embarrassed. I better check. So I walk up to the guy and say, excuse me, sir. Um, he goes, yes. I go, does the name Brandon mean anything to you? And his face changed. His tone changed. Why do you ask that? I was like, oh, hey, hey, I'm a pastor. I believe in Jesus. And uh, I I just got this random thought. So forgive me. I was just wondering, does Brandon mean anything to you? He goes, "Uh, my name is Brandon. Okay, I guess this was the Holy Spirit. That's a pretty good sign, right? I guess this was the Holy Spirit, right? I go, yeah, man, I just felt drawn to you, man. And and, and, and what's going on, man? How are you doing? As I'm talking to him, I hadn't seen this, but as I'm talking to him, I noticed there's a Bible that's sitting right next to him that's open, Right? And as I got to know him, um, he believed in Jesus, studied the Bible, prayed to Jesus, but he hadn't been in church in like over a decade, right? Had been through some stuff and was disconnected. And so just listen, just encourage him. And I I was able to take him over to Ephesians 4, 15 and 17. I said, hey, can I just show you a couple of things that that the word of God says you can have more love and more health and more growth in your life if you're connected into the body of Christ, and just got to share a word. Say, man, can I pray for you? I just prayed over. Had a great time 
of, of impact with him, told him about our church. And, and, but what was it? It was the Holy Spirit speaking to me and through me, right? That the Lord wants to have this ongoing river of life moving in us and through us to a lost and hurting world. There's a lost and hurting world. They want to know that God is real. They want to know that God knows them. They want to know that God cares about them. And all they need is a witness of Jesus' power in their life to nudge them forward. And so these guys in Ephesus, Paul says, man, I've got to teach these guys about the power of the Holy Spirit. So in this story, in these six verses... In this one little ministry transaction, this isn't happening over days and weeks. It might have, I don't know if it happened in 15 minutes or if it happened in three hours, but it's this one ministry encounter. These guys go from only knowing the baptism of John to getting filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesying, right? How do they go from powerless Christians to prophetic voices in one ministry interaction? Is it possible that we have overcomplicated this thing? Is it possible that we have lowered the bar on this thing called Christianity? And so I want to share with you three dynamics in Acts 19, 1 through 6. Three dynamics in Acts 19, 1 through 6. The first one is this. They encountered the one coming after John. The first thing that happens here is they encountered the one coming after John. Say the one. Acts 19.4, Paul said, we read it, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance, and he told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. Now, remember, when the, when the New Testament and the Old Testament were originally written by the authors, they did not use chapters and verses to divide the books up. They didn't use that. They're helpful for us today, but they weren't in, intentionally organized that way by the, by the authors. And so really... Really, probably whoever did this chapter separation, which usually they're very helpful, but whoever did this one, I, I would give them some feedback. I would say, hey, you shouldn't have ended chapter 18 where you ended it. Acts chapter 18 should have kept going through Acts 19.6 at least because at the end of chapter 18, we learn about Apollos who was at Ephesus. And he was an eloquent man. He was a popular man. He had a lot of followers on social media. People thought he was charismatic and he was teaching about Jesus. But the Bible says he knew only about the baptism of John. And Priscilla and Aquila come along and they invite him into their home, a.k.a. small group, and they begin to show him the way of God more accurately to the point where he grows, becomes such a strong disciple of Christ, he gets sent to the church of Corinth to pastor the church of Corinth. And so this all happens at the end of Acts 18, and then we come into Acts 19, and Paul comes to Ephesus where Apollos was, and he finds some of Apollos' disciples. And they knew about Jesus, so they were kind of considered disciples, but they only knew of the baptism of John. They didn't even know about the Holy Spirit. And so he begins to explain these things to him. And he says, listen, John told the people to believe in the one, say the one, the one coming after him. See, he knew that these guys were familiar with the teachings of John the Baptist. And he was trying to connect them. Like, listen, John's baptism was to prepare you for the coming Messiah. And when John the Baptist was here and he started, the Messiah wasn't here yet. But since then, Jesus has come. Jesus has come. And now it's time to move from John's baptism into faith in Jesus. In fact, look at, look at the language here of John the Baptist, which is in several Gospels, here in Mark chapter 1, 7 through 8. These are the words of John the Baptist. See if you can make the connection. It says, he preached, saying, there comes, there comes, there comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And so Paul says, you guys are missing the opportunity. You guys know that John spoke of the one coming after him, and I'm telling you, he's already here, and you know who that guy is. It's the one who's not just going to baptize you in water. He's going to baptize you in the power of the Holy Spirit. You guys don't know who the Holy Spirit is? This is what John was talking about. I'm here to tell you about the one that comes after John. And so he begins to unpack the gospel to him. How does he he exactly unpack it? Well, he makes reference to this in Acts 20, 
verse 17 through 21, he talks about when he first came to Ephesus. He's, he's reminding the Ephesians believers about his first days. Let's read this here. Verse 17, it says, From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. Say Ephesus. So he's calling the elders of Ephesus from, from the church. And when they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day, I came into the province of Asia. So he's talking about the first day. He's talking about Acts 19, 1 through 6. He says this in verse 21. He says, I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. He says, listen, the first thing, I want to introduce you to the one that comes after John. I want you to encounter the one whose sandal strap we are not worthy to untie. The one who will not only baptize you with water, he'll baptize you in the power of the Holy. I want to introduce you to him, but first you need to repent and you need to ask Jesus to cleanse you of your sin, forgive you of your sin, and you need to make him the Lord of your life. This is the first thing you want. You need to do. If you want to hear from God, you need to come under the lordship of Jesus Christ. I've talked to a lot of people. People have a lot of interesting beliefs these days. Well, I kind of read Jesus, and I kind of read Buddha, and I kind of read Muhammad, and I kind of read Tom Cruise. I kind of read all of it. It's just kind of a mishmash, and I'm kind of, I have my own denomination. You know, it's a, it's a congregation of one. You know, it's my own denomination. That's a scary place to be. Don't be there, please. You got to start with Jesus. Jesus is the only one who's died for you. Jesus is the one who's risen from the grave. Jesus poured out his spirit, and God, through Jesus, is ready to speak to you if you have faith in him. Listen, you have to be on God's agenda personally before you help others move on to God's agenda. See, when you, when you hear from God for others and you speak and the gift of prophecy begins to move in your life, you're helping move people onto God's agenda, right? And if you want to be anointed to do that, you first have to be on God's agenda. See, the spiritual momentum to move people on God's agenda is you are in alignment with God's agenda for your own life. And sometimes, unfortunately, believers want to use the prophetic as a shortcut to obedience with God. Well, I just want God to speak to me. I just want to move in the prophetic. I just want to give a word over somebody. Yeah, but you're living with your girlfriend right now, and you're sleeping with her outside of covenant. You've got to hear what God has already revealed and spoken to you. You've got to hear his written word. The will of God has already been revealed to you and you are being disobedient right now. You've got to come underneath what God has spoken to you because he's ready to tell you more. There are things that God wants to speak to you that he can't show you right now because you have disobedience in your life, a.k.a. blessing blockers, a.k.a. sin. And I'm telling you this as a pastor who loves you, who loves you. Listen. This is not guilt and condemnation. We serve a God of grace. How about this? Admit it, quit it, and forget it. God is ready to speak to you, but he can't because you haven't listened to the first thing he's spoken to you. He's told you to repent and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's told you to surrender your life to him and become a disciple to him. He's told you to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow him. foundation, right? We want God to speak to us. We, wanna, we want God to speak through us. You got to make sure that you're on God's agenda first. Have a healthy foundation and watch what God will do. You guys know I love you, right? <laughs> Number two, Paul brought them behind the curtain. Paul brought them behind the curtain. He said, Pastor, now what are you talking about? There was no curtain in Acts chapter 19. It sounded like they were in an open town square. You're right, there was no curtain in the natural realm. But Paul brought them behind the curtain spiritually. See, the reason these guys could prophesy, they just got baptized in water in, to have faith in Jesus, and they get filled with the Spirit. And they, the reason these guys could prophesy is because Paul brought them behind the curtain. 
The reason all God's people can prophesy in the New Testament is because a way has been made for us behind the curtain. That's why it's so important you get to this small group. I, like I said, I filmed 25 minutes more teaching content. This all fits together, and I continue to expound on this foundation that God desires for all of his people to prophesy. In the Old Testament, there was only a select few who were anointed. There was only a select few who prophesied. You know, many of you, you know that I, I like to read commentaries. And I like to study what theologians say. And, and, and so I'm studying this, and I thought, and I came across a great passage. It was this book called Spiritual Gifts by this guy named Dr. David Lim. He was in the first service. And he writes in his books, he says, listen, in Exodus 19, 6, God's original plan when he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, he said he wanted them to be a kingdom of priests. He wanted the whole nation to be a kingdom of priests. And at that time, they stumbled and they began to, to make an idol, a calf idol. They began to worship a calf idol. And it was only the tribe of Levi that stood against idolatry. And so God had to relegate the priesthood, not to the entire nation, but only to a tribe, Levi, of which Aaron was of. And, and, and so throughout the Old Testament, God only anoints a select few. He anoints some judges and some prophets and some kings, and only the tribe of Levi can, can serve in the tabernacle and the temple, and only the sons of Aaron can be priests. And there's a limited amount of the anointing moving throughout the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, but this was not how it was supposed to be. He really wanted everyone to be anointed by God. But in the new covenant, God made a way. How? This is all foundation, friends. Matthew 27, 50 through 51 says, When Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. This is Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. And it says, At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. This is talking about the curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. See, the Holy of Holies could only be accessed by the high priest. He had to bring the, the, the sacrificial blood offering to get into the Holy of Holies. He had to be the high priest, and he could only come in once a year, but he had to continually come in over and over and over again to intercede and get forgiveness for the sins of the people. And there was a curtain that separated the holy place from the Holy of Holies. And then there was an inner court and then there was an outer court and there was a whole process from which only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies and minister before God and minister for and by the people, right? But here it says when Jesus dies, the temple at that time, was the curtain was torn from top to bottom, which means it wasn't man, right? Because you'd have to get up on a ladder to tie it from top to bottom, right? If you're tearing a curtain, you tear it from bottom to top. This was a tear that happened from heaven down to earth, right? And it was symbolic of what was happening in the spirit. It was symbolic of how the new covenant was being fashioned. Look here, because it really was a representation of something going on in heaven. Look here in Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, the holy of holies, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, say curtain, through the curtain that is his body. That when Jesus' body was being torn on the cross, it was the tearing of the curtain that separated man from the holy of holies. And since we have a great, high, a great priest, Jesus, over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. And so at the cross, Jesus opens up the way for everyone, all believers, anybody who believes in Jesus, to go into the Holy of Holies in heaven. To by the Spirit to access the very presence of God. That I don't need a mediator here on earth. I don't need a priest here on earth. I can go directly to God because I have faith in Jesus Christ. And I can experience the presence of God. I can experience the Holy Spirit. And I can hear from God for my own life. And I can hear from God for other people's lives. Do you know my job as a pastor is not to draw you to myself. 
My job is not to get you infatuated with me. My job is not to build, build me up onto a pedestal so that you just think I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread. No, my job is to equip you to have a personal relationship with God so that you know how to go to Jesus. You know how to hear from Jesus. And here's the beautiful thing. If I do my job right, we will have unity in our house. If I do my job right, the Holy Spirit will speak to us individually, but we'll all move together to the same destination. It's a beautiful thing. So again, look at this great theologian that I was reading about this concept. Dr. David Lim says this in his book, Spiritual Gifts. The priestly ministry of the believer is twofold. Foremost is ministry to God. Our lives are to be a spiritual act of worship. Second, practice of a true priestly ministry to God will lead us to our fellow man. That because of the new covenant, because Jesus died on the cross, we are now a, a, a priesthood of all believers now. It's no longer just one tribe. It's no longer just a judge, a prophet, a priest. It's all followers of Christ that can minister to God and minister for God now by the power of the Spirit. Dr. Lim texts me after first service. That was a great teaching. And then his next text was, I'm not just saying that because you quoted me either. That was good. That was good. Listen, Samuel was a priest who also prophesied. David was a king who also prophesied. And now because Jesus made a way for us to go directly to him, we are all a royal priesthood anointed to prophesy. 1 Peter 2.9 says you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Revelation, uh, Revelation chapter 1 verse 6, it says that we are a kingdom of priests. This is why the outpouring of the Spirit is available to all of us because Jesus made a way at the cross for us to go right to God. And so, they encountered the one coming after John. Paul brought them behind the curtain. And then number three, they boldly declare divine encouragement. They boldly declare divine encouragement. They get... They get baptized in water in Jesus' name, identifying with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Paul lays hands on them. They get filled with the Holy Spirit. Spiritual language gets activated in their life. According to Acts chapter 2, according to Acts chapter uh, 10, according to Acts chapter 19, according to 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14, spiritual language begins to flow in their life, and they begin to prophesy. Prophecy, uh, the gift of prophecy is not human encouragement. You say, Pastor, are you just talking about encouraging people? No, that's good to do too, but we're not talking about human encouragement. We're talking about encouraging people from divine revelation. Encouraging people in a way where they realize that God is in the midst of that interaction. That's why the, the gift of prophecy, it works in combination with other gifts. That the word of knowledge is part of the gift of prophecy. Discerning of spirits is a part of the gift of prophecy. A word of wisdom is a part of the gift of prophecy. Miracle signs and wonders can be a part of the gift of prophecy, right? It works in, in partnership with other gifts, but it's prophesying, 1 Corinthians 14, 3, in order to strengthen, encourage, and comfort others. In order to strengthen, encourage, and comfort others. It doesn't say that God gives us the gift of prophecy to judge others, call people religious, and act better than everybody else. <laughs> It doesn't say the gift of prophecy is to harass your pastor and tell him he's doing everything wrong. Oh, that felt good to say that. Pastor, are you putting yourself above correction and accountability? No, no. If you catch me in sin, please confront me, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. If you have some feedback or input for me, please come and talk to me. I'm open to feedback and input. But as soon as you say, Pastor, thus says the Lord, you're doing everything wrong in the church, that's a giant red flag. Because now you're trying to control and manipulate me. 
You're trying to use the old Pentecostal trump card, and I'm not talking politics, okay? You're using the old Pentecostal trump card. Well, God said you're doing it wrong, so if you don't listen to me, you're disobeying God. No, that's the little G, not the big G God, okay? But pastor, okay, strength and comfort and encourage, that sounds very positive. What about all the prophets in the Bible that, 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 that brought correction and discipline and judgment? Yes, they were prophets. There is a difference between the gift of prophecy and the office of the prophet. There's a difference between that. And so the office of the prophet is when there is delegated authority over situations and leadership to be the prophet of God in a situation, right? We'll talk more about that. There's a difference between the gift of prophecy and the office of a prophet, all right? I'm talking about the gift of prophecy, right? That is to build people up. That is to bring healing. It's to bring hope. It's for people to see things they haven't seen before. So Paul taught the churches about spiritual gifts everywhere he went, including the gift of prophecy. And this gift of prophecy is emphasized in the New Testament. The gift, right? 1 Corinthians 12 lists the nine gifts of the Spirit, and one of them is the gift of prophecy. 1 Corinthians 13 continues to talk about the gift of prophecy in the context of love and maturity. 1 Corinthians 14 continues to unpack the exercise of the gift of prophecy in the local church. You go over to Romans chapter 12, there's a different list of spiritual gifts. There's some different spiritual gifts mentioned in Romans 12 than 1 Corinthians 12, but guess what one of the gifts is mentioned in Romans 12? The gift of prophecy. You go to 1 Peter chapter 4, and Peter begins to talk about the spiritual gifts. And what does he say in that passage? He said, let him who speak, speak as the oracles of God. Sounds like the gift of prophecy to me. You go into Ephesians chapter 4, and it talks about the five-fold offices of leadership. It talks about the office of the teacher, and the office of the pastor, and the office of the evangelist, and the office of the prophet, and the office of the apostle. And the office of the prophet functions in the gift of prophecy. Oh, have you had not enough yet? When you talk about the outpouring of the Spirit that happens in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, and they're speaking in spiritual language, and people think these guys are drunk with too much wine. Peter says, no, these guys are not drunk with wine because it's only 9 a.m. in the morning. This is that which the prophet Joel spoke in Joel chapter 2, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. It's emphasized throughout the New Testament. And so Paul, as he's laying hands on them and he's bringing activation in their life, he's empowering them to participate in the mission of the kingdom. The mission of the kingdom. He didn't just lead them to Christ. He wanted to lay hands on them and fill them with the Spirit. Why does the Holy Spirit fill us? Is it so we can have the Pentecostal goosebumps? Is that why? Is it so we can look spiritual in front of our Christian friends? Is that why? No. No. It's to empower us to go out to a lost and hurting world and be witnesses for Jesus. And Paul is saying, I'm coming to Ephesus, and God is ready to move, and I found you 12 guys, and I'm going to get you all the way past John's baptism, but I'm going to lay hands, and you're gonna, we're going to get started today on day one. You're going to know how we're going to do this thing. We're not building with manual tools. We're building with the power tools, man. It's much faster to build with the power tools, Right? I'm going to give you guys the power tools. We got, we got some work to do here, fellas. Worship team, come on up here. Give the people hope. Give the people hope. Oh, God's word is so good. I just love God's word. I just geek out in the Bible. I get all fired up. So what did they prophesy in their own language? Watch this. They spoke with spiritual language and they prophesied. What was the difference? 1 Corinthians 14, prophecy is in the known language, right? And, and so you could understand what, they, what were they prophesying. Full disclosure, we don't really know, okay? So if you come up to me after service and say, Pastor, I know what they were prophesying. Let me tell you, I, I'm not buying it. Don't, don't come and tell me that, all right? You're going to expose yourself, all right? Don't do that. I'm going to think you're off, all right? I'm going to lay hands on you for different reasons, Okay. Now, we don't know what they were prophesying, but there's some options. We know there might be some different things they were prophesying. What could they have been prophesying? Maybe they were prophesying the word of God, right? Remember, God gave Ezekiel a word to prophesy, and he prophesied uh, life to the dry bones, right? Dry bones. Around. Maybe they were just prophesying. Maybe they were like Peter saying, man, we're getting filled with the Spirit, and this is what the prophet Joel said. Uh, all your sons and your daughters will... Maybe they just prophesied the word of God. 
Maybe they prophesied the testimony of Jesus. Maybe they started talking about the, the, the multifaceted glory of Jesus that they were experiencing for the first time in their faith. Revelation 19.10 says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Or maybe they were prophesying the coming Ephesus revival. Ephesians 3, 2, and 6, Paul says, this mystery was hidden from generations past, but it's been revealed now, say now, New Testament, now it's been revealed by his holy apostles and prophets. And what is this mystery? That the Gentiles have equal right with the Jews to the inheritance in Jesus through the gospel. And then Acts 19.10, we learn Paul camps out in Ephesus for three years. For three years, he camps out there. And you know what the Bible says that the fruit of that was? It says that every Jew and every Greek in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Friends, that is revival, if you don't know. That's revival right there. And so these guys, these guys are prophesying. In full disclosure, we don't know what they said, but here's what I do know about their prophesying. I know this. I know that it brought kingdom strength. It brought kingdom encouragement. It brought kingdom comfort to what God was doing. Oh, man, what if we got into a season? What if we got into a season where people on a Sunday morning, they not only got, they only not had an encounter with Jesus, but they got filled with the Holy Spirit and they begin to prophesy that God was gonna do the same to their friends and their family and their city all in one service. Oh, you know, we pray for the presence of God to be on this campus. Oh, we pray for God to fill this campus with his presence. My wife and Pastor Dina and some leaders, they were, they were walking around the campus just praying that this week. And we had a, we had a gentleman, he, he's been walked by this church numerous times, felt like he was supposed to go and never came. And, and he, he was walking by, he made a decision to go check out the church. I think it was a Saturday men's prayer meeting, I think is what it was. And he told us this unsolicited, the moment he stepped foot on this property, he felt the presence of Jesus. <laughs> he came to church this Sunday, came down at the 9 a.m. service. I got to pray with him this morning. I got to lay hands on him. I got to declare the filling of the Holy Spirit over him, that God was ready to speak to him and through him in this season. Oh, are you ready for what God wants to do? Thank you, Lord. Oh, it's not to judge people. It's not to criticize people. It's not to scrutinize people. It's to take the veils off people's life. It's to take them above their hurt. It's to take them above their trauma and their abuse and their toxic history and begin to show them the love of Jesus like they've never seen before. That Jesus sees them differently than a harsh world sees them. That Jesus sees them like he saw me when I was 15. That I had low self-esteem and I had no future. But God said, I have a plan for you, son. I want to use you, son. I got something more for you, son. And I said, Jesus, give me everything you got, Lord God. I'm seeing things differently, Lord. Oh, come on, stand to your feet this morning. Are you ready for God to speak to you today? He wants to show you some things today, and he wants to use you to show other people some things today. And I have this last word that the Lord gave me to share with you this morning. Don't wait for somebody to invite you on stage and hand you a microphone. That is not the gift of prophecy. That's not the only place it lives. There is a demonstration and a model that is given to you here in our services, but the gift of prophecy is for out there. It's for people that have not yet come into his house to know Jesus out there through your life. It's for out there. Thank you, Lord. Oh, do you want it active in your life? Come on, allow God to move you onto his agenda. Allow Jesus to take you behind the curtain and allow him to begin to unlock faith 
He's going to show you things about people you haven't seen before. And you're going to go, man, is that me or is that God? There's only going to be one way to tell. You're going to have to step out. And you might make some mistakes, but I'm going to tell you, you might make some bullseyes too. And it's, it's powerful. Man, you got to get to a group and hear the next part of this teaching in the small group. We continue to expound on it. But as we close here this morning, Go ahead and close your eyes. And you're here and you say, Pastor, you're talking about, you're talking about how these Ephesian disciples, they had to come to Jesus. And if I was to be honest, I don't know where I'm at with God this morning. I don't know if I'm on my way to heaven. I don't know if my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Listen, before you leave this morning, we can take care of some business together with God. I want to pray with you before we dismiss this service. We have prayed for this moment in your life and you may not realize that this morning is a divine appointment. And so in a moment, I'm gonna count to three. And when I get to three, if you need to invite Jesus into your heart as Lord and Savior, maybe it's for the first time, maybe it's for the 10th time. I don't care which time it is. You just know you need to take care of business today. When I get to three, I want you to slip up your hand because Romans chapter 10 says, if you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And I want the privilege and honor of leading you in that prayer this morning. And you can leave this place with the smile of God over your life, ready to hear from him. Hallelujah. Come on, Christians. Are you praying right now? Let me hear you pray right now. Oh, Jesus is so good. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. And I believe the whole Hey, thanks again for checking out ICLV here on YouTube. Hope you're already subscribed, getting notifications. Make sure you're following us on all our social media channels. Download our mobile app and check us out Sundays, 9 a.m., 11 a.m., online, in person. We want to see you there. God bless.